man, what a treat. This is uh, such an honor to be sitting here chatting, meeting through the miracles of Zoom. Uh, one of the absolute best in the business, Michael McCambridge. Um, I I will say it, you know, until the end of time that the, the man you're looking at right now, if you're watching video, listening on podcasts, wrote the greatest football book of our time. Uh, America's Game, the epic story of how pro football captured a nation uh, is honestly the best. What is it going for right now on Amazon? $13.96. That is two drinks <laughs> at your local Starbucks. So once you, you know. Upgrade at Go Long for eight bucks a month, right? That's one drink. You get yourself America's Game, and, and you're all set for this 2024 NFL season. Um, the best book going. Like, I mean, I have flashbacks reading it on on my Kindle. I think is what I read it on, and it was right when Ella, our daughter, was was born. So a lot of sleep, sleepless nights. You know, you don't know what that sleep schedule is going to be. It's an hour here, an hour there. You're just kind of getting by. Uh, but yes, America's Game helped me survive those first few months and definitely cleansed my absolute ignorance when it came to uh, football in the fifties and sixties. Uh, ashamed to even like see those top tens on NFL network pop up when I'm making fun of uh, the Cleveland Browns and the fact that there's shoemakers and bakers in the off season. No football existed back then. And it was glorious. And Michael takes you through the journey. Uh, but yes, we, we have Michael here to dig into his unbelievable three-part series that go along into thin air all on the challenges to three-peat in the Super Bowl era. Never been done before, and we're going to get into it here on the podcast. But, Michael, it is so good to have you here. How's everything been? Thank you for having me. It's been uh, – it was it was a lot of fun to write this series for you. It was, it was something I wanted to do because I have such respect for your website and um, – when I knew this was going to be my summer project, I, I knew I wanted to have it run and go long. So it's been great. Um, I really enjoyed the feedback, both positive and negative. Um, it was, it, it was, I, I wanted to write the piece because I get annoyed by all the hot takes that we are inundated with, especially throughout football off seasons. And Anybody who works in football, anybody who's been in a football team, coached football, and who knows the NFL knows how slender the margins are between victory and defeat. And so anytime you, you know, you've got the draft and somebody says, oh, well, they got Xavier Worthy, so the Chiefs will win it all now. Like, because A, then B, it's just annoying because it's so much more infinitely complicated than that. And that's one of the reasons it is the most popular sport in America. And so I think I made this point during the story. I think as both fans and media, we are pretty smart about contextualizing individual accomplishments. We recognize that Justin Jefferson is an amazing wide receiver from jump. We recognize that, um, Somebody like Kyle Hamilton is remarkable for the range of skills. But I think generally we have a we have a more difficult time placing teams' accomplishments into perspective. And so because it had been so long since a team repeated, and because this is the most competitive era in the history of the NFL, I think that the Chiefs' accomplishments are of a different order than 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 other teams. And their challenges are different. And so that's what I wanted to try to shine some light on in this story. It's it's immaculate. I mean, beautifully written, but also like all of your work, Michael, the, the reporting is deep. And I, I just love how you laid it out in three parts. And mm -hmm. for those who haven't read it, it's it, I really feel like it's not just like a series and it's not just like an individual story. And this is what we try to do from time to time and go along. It's almost like a, like a mini book. I mean, it'll always be there. It'll always be a reference people can kind of tap into. And, and you don't need to be a Chiefs fan, obviously. I think that you get to the heart of the mm -hmm. sport itself. It, like, like you just said there, football, it's unlike any other sport. The NFL is unlike any other league. Uh, it, it's a big reason we're drawn to it. 
but like in baseball, you think about the money ball explosion and how you can just break that game down to numbers like brass right. tacks, just numbers and, and figure out, okay, if I find this player for this position, put him in this spot, we will get here. Basketball, you know, you tank, you, you find the next <laughs> Wemby or the next, uh, you know, chosen one and you're in pretty good shape or you just hope a few stars buddy up and want to play in your market. And then you draft their son who's no good, right? Maybe maybe you do that as well. Foot, <laughs> football, it's just, there's nothing like it. You just got 22 bodies crashing into each other. It takes just unbelievable uh, toughness, physical toughness, but there's so much strategy that goes into it within those 150 plays in the game. And I thought that your series just kind of taps into that and why it's so hard to win mm-hmm. three Super Bowls in a row. I mean, and you mentioned it there too, Michael, that this is the most competitive era in the history of the NFL. That's a strong statement from somebody who knows the history of the NFL better than anybody in the country. Why do you say that? Well, I, you know, I, I, I appreciate what you said about um, respecting the game in the fifties. And certainly those were, those were some great players, but you also have to remember, um, <clears throat> you know, when the Packers won three in a row, they had to win two postseason games. You know, that was, it was it was pretty straightforward, um, and even as recently as the early '70s, the level of competition was just all over the map. You had, you know, you had drunk owners like Robert Ursay walking down to the locker room at the end of a game and firing coaches left and right. You had the New Orleans Saints had a general manager who they hired to run the football team who was a former astronaut, knew nothing about football, but they like, well, he seems quite competent. Let's make him a general manager. Um, I can also remember the story of that Saints team in the early 70s. I want to say it was 71, um, when the Raiders drafted Raymond Chester in the first round. Wasn't even on the Saints board. And I'm just imagining sitting there in New Orleans, the draft HQ, and they get the announcement from New York that the Oakland Raiders have taken Raymond Chester and the entire personnel group is looking around at each other going I I don't know who he is we don't we don't have him so (laughs) that sort of variance has been severely curtailed in the modern era when there is so much money and so much exposure and so much pressure and when the path to the Super Bowl involves at least three and possibly four games and so I think that you know, and I, I alluded to this in the story, the remarkable thing about the, the Kansas City Chiefs of Andy Reid and Patrick Mahomes, they're certainly not the most dominant team in NFL history. Um, you know, the Packers, the Steelers, those teams were much more dominant. But in this extremely competitive age, they've won three Super Bowls in five years, and they trailed in double digits in each one of those Super Bowls. And they've now won seven playoff games in a row against a remarkable lineup of teams. And, you know, I didn't quantify this, but I've heard other people say this. You would be hard pressed to find a postseason run more impressive than Dolphins at home, Bills on the road, Ravens on the road, 49ers in the Super Bowl. That's that's quite a murderer's row to get through. Uh, especially in a year when, um, you know, you and me were the receivers. <laughs> it is so true. I mean, for, for months, it was gaff to gaff to gaff. Marquez Valdez Scanlon, I'm thinking, against the Eagles in the primetime game. Kadarius Tony lines up off sides. Yeah. Um, there were some questionable calls against the Packers, if I remember correctly. Mm-hmm. And it was it was one thing after another. And I want to get to Mahomes later in this conversation because I cannot wait to hear what you think about his prospects of being the greatest of all time. But in in part two of the series, again, into thin air, go along td.com, accessible to all of our paid subscribers. It is absolutely worth upgrading if you're just on our free list or just listen here on the podcast. Uh, Michael B. Cambridge, the best in the business. Part two, though, you you went into all eight. All eight teams that went back to back, and I'm try- I'm trying to figure out which which team I think is most fascinating, uh, and it, 
I know we've got a lot of Packer fans who you probably heard from a few of them, right? They, they, mm-hmm. they, they want to throw in that NFL championship and we'll, we'll get your take on that. I'm sure. But what was the most fascinating team of those eight to re- when you really dug into your research and you're talking to me and Joe green and Tony Dungy and Eric Davis and Ernie, Accorsi. like we said, you, you talked to a ton of people for this series. Um, what, what was the team that was most fascinating to you of those eight? Well, there were two. One was the 76 Steelers, because in terms of, you know, back in the age of 40 man rosters, one to 40, or it might have been 45 then, one to 45, they were probably still the best team in football. But they got extraordinarily unlucky at the beginning of the season, and then they lose their quarterback. And so they've got Mike Kruchek, rookie quarterback. <laughs> um, And they've just got no hope, but that's when the steel curtain defense, certainly the best defense I've seen in my lifetime was that mid seventies Steelers defense goes on this terrific run and just shuts everybody down and beats a really good Baltimore Colts team, 40 to 14 in the playoffs. But in a, in an era dominated by rushing, they lose Franco Harris and they lose Rocky Blyer, both thousand yard rushers that year. And then they have to go back out to Oakland and, and they don't do it. Um, that was fascinating. Just um, to me, it was one of those things. That's a reminder that sometimes the greatest performances do not end in confetti and a Super Bowl trophy. I can remember um, that last year that he was with the jets, Bill Parcells saying he did maybe his best coaching job with that Jets team that I want to say began 0 and 4. Um, and I think by the same token, Chuck Noll said he'd never forget that 76 Steelers team bouncing back from a 1 and 4 start. And Joe Turkey Jones of the Browns spiking Terry Bradshaw on the field, you know. Um, so that was one. And then the other one was the 1990 San Francisco 49ers. Because going back and reading Sports Illustrated, the Sporting News, the New York Times, during the playoffs in 1990, everybody acted like, oh, it was it's going to be the 49ers. Joe Montana had just been named Sportsman of the Year by Sports Illustrated. 49ers had gone 14-2 and two in the regular season. They looked untouchable. But to get back to the purpose of the story... One of the reasons I wanted to do this deep dive on all eight of the of the teams that had won back to back is I wanted to see what I could learn, what what commonalities existed. Some of it won't apply because it was different eras, different rules, different rules about player acquisition. There wasn't free agency before 95. But one of the things that was true in all eight instances, and I presume may be true for the Chiefs this year, is the good fortune that inevitably accompanies a championship season in the NFL. And by definition, a company is winning back-to-back titles sooner or later runs out. And so that great 49ers team is at home against the New York Giants who have to play with a backup quarterback. Bill Sims hurts his foot. So you got Jeff Hostetler in there. And they had played earlier in the year. Giants couldn't score a touchdown. They play in the NFC Championship. Giants still can't score a touchdown. But... Montana gets knocked out for the game. Uh, The Giants run a fake punt that gains 30 yards because the 49ers have 10 men on the field because Bill Romanowski, who was a special teams ninja, got injured on the previous play and wasn't out there. And the 49ers are still winning 13 to 12 with the ball in Giants territory in the last three minutes of the game. And then Roger Craig fumbles. And, you know, it's just, it's just an instance of the more steps you have to take to get through the playoffs, the more chances there are for some freak series of events to occur and you wind up losing. And it was, it was one of the things that every coach pointed out. Well, one of the things that's different about football, just one game, single elimination, you don't get best of seven. You don't get to say, well, we had a bad, we had a bad road game, but we'll we'll pick it up next time. You don't get to say, well, 
we've got the top of our rotation coming back for games three, four, and five. You just get one chance. And one of the great and cruel things about football is anything can happen in that one game. And it's, I'm thinking of Roger Craig fumbling that ball. You know, if, if they, if he doesn't and they win that game and they win yeah. a third straight Super Bowl, like he, he's probably in the Hall of Fame or at least it but helps they, his cause a little bit. I mean, every legacies can just change on a dime with one play. And I, I think they should. I mean, these, these games matter, you know, a hundred times more than anything you see in the regular season. You know, when, when the Bills play the Jets mm-hmm. in week 12, that doesn't matter as much as seeing Mahomes again in the playoffs. I mean, that that that's why we love football. We know what's at stake. We know it's a, it's one game right. and anything can happen. And that, that one night, and just to backtrack too, I just want to pull up uh, those 76 Steelers. Mike Krucek, what about this for a, a stat line that season? He's 6-0 and as a starter, right? Wins, win, if, if you think wins are a quarterback stat, here you go. 6-0, and and he uh, completed 51, pa- 51 of 80, 85 passes for 758 yards, zero touchdowns, and three interceptions. Uh, got, got six wins, though. I mean, the, the scores of those, that defense, unbelievable. That run, they're 1-4 and four, like yeah. you referenced. And then they they win 23 to 6, 27 zip, 23 zip, 45 zip, 14 to 3. And then to end the season, 7 to 3, 42 nothing, 21 nothing. I think you wrote this probably the best run of defensive football we'll ever see yeah. in, in the sport. And they didn't yeah. they didn't win the Super Bowl that year. That's right. And I, and just a a phenomenal team. And, you know, the other thing about that, and this was true of the Cowboys in 94 as well, that Steelers team had blocked the Oakland Raiders, who were also a great team in that era. And that Raiders team, talk about always the bridesmaid, never the bride. They lose Super Bowl II. They lose to the Jets in the AFL title game before the Jets win Super Bowl III. They lose to the Chiefs before the Chiefs win Super Bowl IV. They lose to the Colts in the playoffs before the Colts win Super Bowl V. Then they lose to the Dolphins and twice in a row to the Steelers. So the entire apparatus of the Oakland Raiders and John Madden and Al Davis and all the most talented players were, and I am not using this term lightly, obsessed with beating the Pittsburgh Steelers. And they did it at the beginning of the season. And that sort of pierced the aura of Steeler in invincibility. And they did it in the AFC championship game and finally went on to win. Same thing happened to the Cowboys in 1994. They'd beaten the 49ers in 92. They'd beaten the 49ers in 93. Eric Davis talking about that team. He was like, you know, three days after the end of the playoffs, I went back to work. I couldn't sleep. I couldn't do anything. We we were just obsessed. We were going to beat the Cowboys because we had to beat the Cowboys. And so they signed Deion Sanders. Now we're in a different era. Now you're in an era of free agency. They signed Deion Sanders. They signed Ken Norton Jr. away from the Cowboys. And now they got the pieces there. And, you know, I you, you can't help but thinking about that when you look at the Ravens signing Derrick Henry, some of the things the Bills did, you know, some of the changes teams are making to try to compete with the king of the hill right now, which is the Chiefs. Man, so when Jerry Jones sits down with uh, Clarence Hill, I believe, you know, longtime Cowboys beat writer this week and says something like, yeah. so he, he said he's the man for the job. Quote, yeah. hell no, there's nobody that could effing come in here and be a GM any better than I can. Well. <laughs> When you hear his defiance in 2024, uh, what right. goes to your mind, Michael? Because as you wrote, I mean, there, there he is at the, was it the owner's meeting when him and Jimmy Johnson yeah. uh, reported? Crosswise. <laughs> you know, the, some things never change. Some things never change. I remember somebody once saying, players play, coaches coach, owners own. <laughs> and, you know, there's, 
I'll get off on a, a quick tangent here. There's a story that Dick Vermeil likes to tell about the power of owners. He gets his first pro job coaching the Eagles and Leonard Tose um, is down the hall as the owner. And Tose is temperamental alcoholic, just kind of wheels off character. Um, but he hired Vermeil. And so or it's the off season, players are gone, but they're just installing things. And Toast tells him to come down every Friday afternoon, just give him an update. So Vermeil comes down the first Friday afternoon. Toast invites him in, says if he wants, you know, ask him what he, he's got some whiskey. Can I get you some whiskey? And Vermeil says, no, thank you, Leonard. I'm, I'm a wine drinker. So they have their conversation. Next week, Vermeil comes in on Friday afternoon. Toast says, hey, do you want some whiskey? Vermeil says, well, no, actually, I, I just drink wine. Thank you very much. Um, they have their conversation. The third week, Vermeil comes in. Toast says, do you want some whiskey? And Vermeil says, yeah, sure. Give me some whiskey because owners set the rules. <laughs> and that's that's what Jerry Jones has going for him. So he can't be fired. Um, I know I live in Austin and I know a lot of frustrated Cowboys fans. Um, and, you know, they're just waiting for nature to run its course. <laughs> It's amazing. I mean, the NFL, it really is Game of Thrones. I mean, I'm yeah. just picturing somebody just walking into a Tywin Lannister's lair <laughs> and him just staring you down saying, you you drink from the chalice. You <laughs> shall drink from the chalice. No, you're in my territory. You're on Lannister. You drink from the chalice. And that's, that's what it is. And you have all the backstabbing and all the little fingers at play behind the scenes as well. That is an awesome story. Man, so uh, let's get to these Chiefs then. I mean, knowing... What you know, and again, every everybody read it in great detail. It's what, 15, 16,000 words. It's all there on, on the challenges that go into three-peating in the Super Bowl era. And it's harder than ever to do it. Free agency. I mean, look at the AFC. C.J. Stroud. Oh, may, rising star, maybe he is a star. The Bills aren't going anywhere. I mean, the Cleveland Browns may have the most talented roster around the quarterback position. The Ravens, they were the best team in the regular season last year. We can go on and on and on. Are the Chiefs going to do it? Do you do you think the Kansas City Chiefs three peat? If they do, why why would they? And to you, what is the number one in, in impediment holding them back from potentially making history here? The the number one impediment is the American Football Conference right now is historically top heavy. I mean, you know. I, you probably are as keenly aware of this as anybody, but the discussion around Josh Allen has become just demented. Um, Josh Allen is being judged on losing playoff games to the Chiefs. And one of them was maybe the greatest playoff game anybody's ever seen, which he played heroically in. And the other one, just this past season, was another terrific Allen performance that could have been another great overtime game if your kicker doesn't miss a 42 yarder in the, in the fourth quarter. Um, just as, you know, the perception of Mahomes, his first MVP year, he gets shut up by Bill Belichick's Patriots in the 2018 AFC championship game, and then scores 31 points in the second half and plays heroically, but D Ford jumps off sides. And so now Brady has seven rings Mahomes has only three. If Brady had had six and Mahomes has four now, think of how the conversation changes. So again, fine margins. I I would not say, oh, the Chiefs will three-peat. I certainly understand Tony Dungy's um, policy of, in the NFL, you never bet on the champions to repeat. 18 of the last 19 years, that's been a been a sound strategy. I certainly think the Chiefs can repeat. Uh, if you ask me what the what the most important thing is, I would say the most important thing is Steve Spagnolo's defense continues to be a top 10 defense. Um, what Mahomes and the Chiefs had last year, they'd never had before, which was a defense that could win you games. They'd had a bend but don't break defense. They'd had a decent defense. They'd had an opportunistic defense. Uh, but that was still a defense that allowed 35 points to the Philadelphia Eagles in Super Bowl 57. And they won because, for one thing, the defense created a touchdown 
with that Nick Bolton fumble return for a touchdown. And the other thing is Mahomes could put the, you know, the three spot up when, when they needed. Um, but as competitive as the AFC is, the Chiefs need not just to continue having a top 10 offense, but they need to have a defense that can go a ways toward, if not shutting down, then disrupting the Lamar Jacksons, the Josh Allens, the Joe Burrows uh, of, and the CJ Strouds of the conference. Um, it's it's going to be amazing to watch. And, um, you know, whichever way it turns out, it is just so delicious to take a look at all of these matchups that we're going to see. And I think I mentioned in the story, uh, Aaron Schatz and the FTN Football Almanac says eight of the best 12 teams in pro football are in the AFC. By definition, one of those eight teams is not even going to make the playoffs. So it is it is brutal. And, you know, I will also mention the AFC West, which two years ago people were saying was going to be the greatest division ever and now is being dismissed as you know, the Chiefs and no one else, if the Chargers get it together and play well this year, they've got a fourth place schedule. So the Chiefs, because of their first place schedule, have to play the Bills, the Texans, and the 49ers. Those are their three uncommon games because of position scheduling. The Chargers get to play the Patriots, the Titans and the Cardinals. So, you know, if the if the Chargers can sweep the Raiders and Broncos, they've got a path to 10 or 11 wins. And the Chiefs, because everybody's gunning for them and also because they have a brutal first place schedule, you know, they could get a serious challenge in their division for the first time in a couple of years. Right, and there's part of me that wants to be hesitant to jump on that charger bandwagon after sure. doing that with the Falcons last year, you know, we're, we're hearing about positionless players and paying the money to Chris Lindstrom, hundred million dollars for a guard. You bring in Jesse Bates. Like you're never supposed to do this stuff. You're never supposed to draft a running back in the top 10. I was in like, I, I thought Arthur Smith was onto something. And then as it turns out, you know, when Desmond Ritter single-handedly loses you three games with just, you know, boneheaded yeah. decisions, no fault of his own. He's a third round pick. He's, he's Desmond Ritter put in that position. Um, mm -hmm. Those three games could, could have won you the division. And then who knows Desmond Ritter is not Justin Herbert. <laughs> so exactly. I kind of like what Justin Jim Harbaugh's Herbert. doing, changing the yeah. attitude of the team. And you also have one of the best quarterbacks in football. And you've got, I mean, you know, I, I have highly complicated, very mixed feelings about Jim Harbaugh. Um, I think that, um, he his his public proclamations of belief in the Lord seem to increase as the NCAA investigations of improprieties in the Michigan program increased. Um, but he is a terrific football coach, and there is no reason to believe that that culture change is not going to instantly transform the Los Angeles Chargers. And they've got a new complex, and they've still got some real blue chip players. So. I think they look like they're still a year away, but they could arrive ahead of schedule. And it's, it seems lazy, but like, I just come back to, but Mahomes, I mean, Patrick Mahomes is Michael Jordan in his prime right now. And I get it. I would probably take the field as well. I'm with Tony Dungy there and the, the, the chargers are going to be good. You know, even those other games, I mean, the Raiders, they beat the chiefs at Arrowhead mm -hmm. on Christmas. And, you know, Sean Payton's a super bowl winning coach, but, there's so I mean, you hear him too. There's just so many stories about Patrick. This is who he's always been. He's always just found a way when the pressure's the highest and he's got to be at his best. And I, I think like next gen, they measured his heart rate in the 13 seconds game. <laughs> and, and, you know, like when he took the field for those 13 seconds, I mean, he was as calm as can be. His, mm -hmm. his heart rate's not spiking up and down. He's, he's not nervous. And his friends say, that's just who Patrick Mahomes has been his entire life. I mean, Coleman Patterson, we've talked to him for some stories here to go along. And um, I had to pull it up because I had to kind of refresh my memory. But after they lost that Super Bowl to the Bucs, 
So mm-hmm. he's running around for 497 yards before sacks right. and completions, just running for his damn life. Their offensive mm-hmm. line needs work, obviously. So he's he's at Augusta with his, you know, playing. You know, this is just two weeks after the 2021 Masters. And mm-hmm. you can never really use your phone out there. There's a lot of rules, but his phone kept ringing and ringing and ringing. And his caddy thought he should know, like, hey, there could be something wrong here. And it was Andy Reid, Brett Veach, letting him know, that we're trading for Orlando Brown. We're getting you a left tackle. And Patterson, his buddy, was with him. He said, quote, you could tell something in his demeanor changed because he was like, I got my blind side protected. I'm good. <laughs> and he had just, he was on the six, the, the 16th hole. You know, he just hit a shot into the bunker. And he looked at him right, right, this, after he finds out he's got his left tackle. Looks at his buddy and said, hey, look, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to par this. And they're, oh, no way. No, no chance in hell. <laughs> And he just chips it out of the bunker, six feet from the hole, drills it. I mean, this is who he's always been, whether he's, you know, throwing hatchets at a bachelor party in Nashville, playing baseball, obviously. He was a hell of a basketball player. He just, yeah. that's Michael Jordan, right? He just takes it from here to here. Tom Brady had it. Patrick Mahomes has it. It's It, it could seem boring, but I don't know. I have a hard time betting against him this season or, or any season when he's playing like he does in the playoffs. And- Boy, it 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 seems the opposite of boring to me because there's there is that sense of football as as we as we've alluded to earlier is such a team game, the ultimate team game, and every one of those fifty three players can affect the outcome, and so there's a limited amount of impact that any one player can have in football, even the player at the most important position, and yet Mahomes has consistently tipped the scales and consistently been the difference. And that drive in overtime to win the Super Bowl, including that fourth down, you know, what has been called a match point where you have to get the first down or the game's over right then and there in the middle of the field. And all the things that go wrong, you know, uh, <laughs> Marquez Valdez Scantling gets the ball and tries to get extra yards and winds up losing like seven yards. And, you know, you got to deal with all of those things. And Mahomes so, so composed and you get the sense that he would have been much more nervous that he was much more nervous when Brock Purdy's got the ball and the 49ers are just a few yards away from the first down. That's going to close out the game and they can just run the clock down and kick a field goal to win it, that he would have been much more nervous there than he was with the ball in his hands. As I've heard people say in the interviews I did and in other outlets in this offseason, the really remarkable thing is Mahomes continues to work on his game and continues to get better. So it is a jungle out there, and they've got a lot of things going against them. But if they get to the playoffs, especially if they get to the playoffs and can play games in Arrowhead, they are going to be a really tough out. And it's going to be a fascinating drama to watch over the course of the season. And and I'm with you. It ain't boring to me. I think we've got to appreciate greatness. I just, I'm just thinking back to like those, those nineties NBA. I mean, that was my heyday as a kid, you know, as a Charlotte Mm -hmm. Hornets fan, you know, Alonzo morning and, you know, I'll think of Carl Malone and Gary Payton and, I mean, Hakeem Olajuwon had a little glory in there when Jordan was playing baseball. But I think, like, the voters just were bored by the excellence. <laughs> and the, you know, <laughs> yeah. They're voting Carl Malone, MVP. Mm-hmm. And I, I just hope that – and, and maybe they do. I just hope everybody can really appreciate it in the moment. You know, here in Western New York, I don't think there's much appreciation. There's probably, <laughs> you know, some other emotions. Also considering this is who the owner wanted and, in that draft and, just, and made it known. Let me say one more thing. The the one of the one of the comments that meant the most to me that I think put the this challenge in the best perspective was Brian Billick pointed out, um, you know that you can't say the Chiefs didn't earn it. They go to Buffalo, they go to Baltimore, but now you look at this AFC the way it is now, and how many of these really good teams with really good quarterbacks do you have to go through? Maybe the Chiefs are better than Buffalo. Maybe they're better than Baltimore. Maybe they're better than Cincinnati. Maybe they're better than Houston. But they're not going to be a lot better than each of those teams. So there's a very small margin for error. And the thing that you come back to 
is unlike the San Francisco 49ers with Brock Purdy, Buffalo, Baltimore, Cincinnati, Houston, each one of those teams has a quarterback who can take over a game, who can not just manage the game and run the offense, but can take over a game. And so with the small margins, it's going to come down to, you know, who has the ball last, who gets to take over the game. Mahomes got to take over the game at the end of so many playoff games, got to take over the game at the end of this past Super Bowl. But what if the score is tied and there's a minute and a half left and now Buffalo has the ball or Baltimore has the ball? What if it's out of his hands? That's what we have to see. And that's why I think it's so important that the Chiefs defense continues to perform to the levels it's been at if they're going to do this nearly impossible thing. How many just greats are vanquished in the Mahomes era too? Oh, I mean, yeah. I think that Josh Allen is still squarely in his prime. I'm I'm totally with you on on the discourse. It's a little out of because even when you do look at the turnovers, yeah, he's turned the ball over a ton, but he doesn't do it inside the twenty. And, you know, he's almost perfect inside the twenty, and he's been almost perfect in the playoffs. If you go back and look, this doesn't even count when the Bills squandered a, a sixteen to nothing lead to the Texans in the in the twenty nineteen wild card. The four playoff losses since, three mm-hmm. of them against Mahomes, obviously, and one against Burrow. Here's how the Bills' defense has fared. All right, so if you take out kneel downs at the end of a halves in the game and everything, 32 drives for this Bills' defense. They've allowed 16 touchdowns, eight field goals, have forced only six punts. They, there's a missed field goal in there. They've created only one turnover. They've given up 134 points. That's 3.52 points per drive. Um, mm. That's not Josh Allen's fault. That's hard, hard a combination of the Bills' defense, Sean McDermott, Patrick Mahomes, in that moment, when legacies are defined, Mahomes just finds a way. He he wills yeah. this Chiefs team mm-hmm. to win. So, man, I'm excited. I, I'm really excited for this season. Just talking to you, Michael, and man, you got me really excited. Just at editing your story, which I should say required like no editing. Your writing, your reporting is <laughs> like I said, unbelievable. Uh, everybody, please make a point to carve out. 40 minutes, an hour of your time to, to read it in its entirety. You will not be disappointed um, into thin air. Why it's nearly impossible to win three straight Super Bowls. It's at golongtd.com. Michael, it's a pleasure and an honor to have you writing at go long and just know you're welcome. Anytime. I know you've got a lot on the plate. If you ever have a notion, right? If you're, if you're stepping up to that three point line and you want to heat check, you want to put, just <laughs> let me know, let me know. And you've got carte blanche here, always. All right, sounds good. Please keep up the good work. Get enough sleep, eat enough vitamins, and uh, look forward to reading you in the season ahead. Thank you so much, Michael. Appreciate it.